Hello and welcome to The Virus. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Have we reached the peak of this current Omicron wave? Health officials think we may have now had the worst of it after COVID ripped through aged care facilities and filled emergency wards in hospitals around the country. I'm increasingly confident that we have reached the peak and certainly the actual data uh, that we're seeing, particularly from hospital admissions uh, decreasing in all states over the last few days and a week, uh, support that. This is not the last wave. Uh, this is the end of this, this is coming towards the end of this wave or at least peaking of this wave. There will be a tail in, in hospitals. Many older people with many other diseases other than, than COVID have been admitted. That's the, the, the word we're getting from clinicians, clinicians on the ground. Um, but this will not be the last wave and we will continue to have to plan for that. So these are the latest reported cases. You can see there's been a fall in recent days, but the government's saying we need to stay vigilant because it may have just been a blip caused by fewer people moving around during the school holidays. Nevertheless, that fall is translating to a drop in the number of people in hospital nationally. There are around 850 fewer people being treated compared to last week. Not all states are experiencing a fall in the number of hospitalisations. In South Australia, for example, there are more patients with COVID in hospital this week compared to last week. All this coincides with the health minister announcing that COVID-19 vaccines will be offered to certain children aged between six months and five years. ATAGI has not uh, recommended uh, vaccination for children under five years of age who do not fit one of those three categories of immunocompromised complex health conditions or disability. And I might just indicate uh, the reasons why. Um, ATAGI, ATAGI's reasons for that is that uh, these children um, aged under five have a very low likelihood of severe illness from COVID-19. Uh, they go on to say though, given that this is a very new vaccine, only being rolled out in very few countries so far, um, that this is under ongoing consideration based on the data of the disease burden and epidemiology, uh, vaccine supply, emerging data on vaccine use in this age group and the availability of new vaccines for the age group as well. But the vaccine advisory body has noted there was insufficient evidence to suggest that vaccination of infants and children would have any impact on community transmission. Let's get more from Associate Professor Asha Bowen. She's a clinician researcher at Perth's Children's Hospital and is the head of skin health at the Centre of Vaccines and Infectious Diseases at the Telethon Kids Institute. She joins us now from Perth. Dr Bowen, welcome to the program. We've just heard the Minister say that there are not a lot of countries rolling out vaccinations to under fives. What will it have taken in Australia to get that rollout happening, to get this approval done? So it, we've gone through a few stages. The clinical trial was done internationally and then it was, the vaccine was approved by the FDA in the US and then a, um, the TGA in Australia has approved the vaccine for use here in Australia. And then this week we've heard the recommendations from ATAGI, which is our um, advisory group on how to um, administer a vaccine. So with the Moderna vaccine, there are, I guess, a few things to consider about it. And one of them is that balance that we we're just hearing about between the disease burden in this age group as well as um, those higher risk groups. And so a process of choosing to vaccinate the higher risk groups first has been recommended by ATAGI. Now, how different is this Moderna vaccine compared to what's generally available for the rest of us? So at the moment, we've got a number of brands available and the Moderna vaccine is an mRNA vaccination. And the reason it's slightly different for this age group is it's a lower dose. So an adult receives 100 micrograms of the, the vaccine. The youngest children are receiving a much smaller dose, which is the 25 micrograms, so a quarter of the adult dose. And does that apply to six months old all the way up to five-year-olds? That's the way it's being administered, yes. Why is it that there's not a, a graduation of that dosage, given that there's quite a big growth spurt that happens between those ages? That's a really great question. And essentially, we have to, I guess, balance pragmatics of uh, what the type of vaccine, how it can be produced and administered to children in this age group with the clinical trial information that's emerged and trying to make sure that the um, amount given generates a robust immune response. And I think that's been a challenge for this particular age group in particular, some of the other vaccine brands haven't yet achieved that data. So it really is um, a complex piece of trying to fit a safe and effective dose 
that can be practically applied in a particular age range. And so I agree there is a, a lot of growth that happens between six months and five years, but this has been looked at very closely in those trials to make sure that it's the right dose. What will this particular rollout do for community transmission? I think it's unlikely to have an impact on community transmission, and that was very clear in the Atagi statement. However, it is being used as a protective vaccine such that children in this age group may not need to be hospitalised if they have some of these high-risk conditions. And um, definitely it's protective against um, very severe outcomes such as ICU admission or death. So I don't think vaccinating this particular age group is likely to impact transmission across our community, as we have seen with vaccinating every other age group, but it's most definitely had an impact on the severity of disease as well as hospitalisation cases. So it won't necessarily follow that other six-month to five-year-olds will be vaccinated in due course? I think that's a, a question that remains open, and Atagi has definitely given that framework to enable this to occur as more vaccine becomes available, as well as we we learn how much of this vaccine is getting to the right um, children in the age group. So I suspect over the next three to four months, we will hear more recommendations for broader use in this particular age group, a little bit like we had in 2021 when higher risk groups were prioritised to receive the vaccine due to availability, as well as um, trying to make sure that the most at risk receive the vaccine first. We know there are a couple of factors up in the air, including uh, new variants coming down the line, but what is the likelihood of COVID vaccination status for this particular age group becoming a condition to access things like childcare? I don't expect that that will be the case. I think that that alludes to vaccine mandates and I don't we haven't seen vaccine mandates become part of um, childhood and our adolescent vaccines in the same way they have, say, with um, workplaces for adults. But I do think it relates also to um, the encouragement that we have as a society to vaccinate our children with a national immunisation program. And so those do have rules around them that impact on, on some of those things that you're saying. I don't expect that COVID will be included in those, but that's, I guess, an open question and I don't know the answer right now. Uh, for those kids who are vulnerable and whose parents are considering the COVID vaccine for the under fives, is timing important in how it's administered in conjunction with other vaccinations and medications? So it has been recommended that it can be given with other vaccines. Um, it doesn't have to be um, separated per se, but I do think if there's the opportunity to do that, then that, that has also been included in the statement. So ultimately, we want to make sure that the children who are highest risk receive the vaccine as soon as possible now that it's becoming available. And there's um, obviously an eight week interval between doses that's been recommended. Dr. Asher Bowen, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, we often hear that better ventilation is one of the best ways to stop the spread of COVID. But how dangerous is the air that we breathe? Well, it depends where you are. Tegan Taylor is the ABC's health and science reporter and the co-host of the Coronacast podcast. She joins us now. Tegan, great to see you. So CO2, why CO2 and what's that got to do with COVID? Right. So CO2 itself, it's carbon dioxide. It's Part of what we breathe out when we breathe out and uh it's a good mock it's a good proxy for whether or not if you're breathing out a lot of carbon dioxide and there's a lot of carbon dioxide in this environment that you're in that perhaps if someone in that environment has COVID, then you could be breathing that in as well so we can't measure the virus levels in the air but we can measure the carbon dioxide so it becomes a proxy for it and there are monitors that exist to tell us what the level of carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere or in the environment that we are and a keen coronacast listener actually wrote into us said you should borrow my carbon dioxide monitor and take it around because I bet you'll be surprised by what you find around you. And me, who's done a podcast about the coronacast for two and a half years, was like, I think I know everything. But it really was eye-opening. Where did you take this monitor and what did you do with it? Right. So, I mean, this is the monitor here that uh, Brendan lent us. And it, basically what you can see is... It, it, the numbers don't really mean anything to you in and of themselves, but it kind of gives you a, a, an idea of like if it's, you know, safe, if it's kind of, if it's in the amber zone, then maybe it's a little bit um, like put a mask on and if it's in the red zone, it's perhaps get out. Oh, it's refreshing, but because I'm breathing right on it, it's uh, it's going up. So yeah, I took, it, I took it around with me for a couple of weeks and it just happened to be in a fortnight where I was traveling on aeroplanes, I was going to the gym, I was going in meeting rooms with other people. It was sort of like as we were really kind of opening up again. 
And yeah, it really was quite eye-opening. Like at home, you sort of don't really think so much about it. But when I went to the supermarket, there weren't a lot of people there. It was still sort of maybe kind of getting towards the amber zone. Unsurprisingly, on the aeroplane, it was really high, uh, although planes are fitted with HEPA filters, which filter out um, viruses, and also everyone's wearing a mask for most of the time. Uh, the, the one that really was eye-opening for me was when I got on a bus in Sydney, which wasn't part of my plan for that night, and realised how high the, the levels were and realised that there really wasn't anything I could do except for just wait it out. So, yeah, definitely um, an illuminate, illuminating experience. And then shock horror, the family car. Oh, my gosh. So, I mean, you live in the same house as your family, That's as your household, that's kind of the point. But we did go for a road trip and I happened to have the carbon dioxide monitor in the car, looked at it and thought, gosh, that's really high. Good thing it's just me and the family in the car. And then literally the next day, my husband tested positive for COVID. And it was that moment of just going, like, even with your own family, you can have a, a, a less safe environment. And so that was dumb. <laughs> um, however, what, one of the really amazing things was throughout his isolation period, we were really conscious of keeping the house well ventilated, even though it's winter, and no one else caught it. So despite the car ride, I think having the house well ventilated while having a positive person in the house could have made a difference. It's interesting that you don't seem to hear about ventilation as being one of the frontline primary mitigating factors about stopping the spread. Do you get a sense from experts about why that is? One of the experts we spoke to is literally one of the global experts on ventilation, Lydia Morowska from Queensland University of Technology. So yeah, homegrown hero uh, for us in Australia. And she said things like vaccines and masks, they have a a benefit to society, obviously, but they're very much relying on individuals taking action, whereas ventilation in common areas like businesses and, um, yeah, places of work and that sort of thing, like not at, in private residences, it really relies on governments or industry to take the lead with that and, uh, and not be relying on individuals to make those changes. And so regulating it is harder but she says it would it would make a much bigger difference. And in the same way that we just assume that the water coming out of our tap that's provided to us is safe to drink, uh, Lydia and other experts argue that we should have a right to clean, safe air to breathe when we're in communal spaces. But experts like her are getting together to talk about this issue, right, at, at sort of professional conferences, <laughs> basically. Well, funny story about that. Lydia actually told us that when she was at a conference on ventilation, they threw a dinner for her in her honour because she is one of these global experts of it and she caught COVID at the conference, <laughs> at the dinner. What are the chances? We, I mean, <laughs> Pretty I, high, I, apparently. I <laughs> well, she's actually said she had a little carbon dioxide monitor with her, similar to what I've got. She said she got to this dinner and looked at it and thought, this isn't a safe environment, but she didn't feel like she could leave. To have a revolution around the way we think about airflow, what would that mean practically for regulation? I mean, what would change in real life? It really, it, it, there would need to be, there are clean air acts in different parts of the world. So Europe and the U US and that sort of thing, they do have uh, regulations around how many air exchanges there are an hour or how many volume uh, like what, how many litres per person per second of air need to be kind of coming in and out of an environment. Uh, often achieving that is as simple as opening a window, but then we've also known before COVID, if you can cast your mind back that far, we had the black summer of bushfires and sometimes the outside air is less safe to breathe than what's inside. So sometimes what's needed are things like HEPA filters, like we said before, UV light um, irradiating the air that's coming through to kill any pathogens that might be in it. And and other sort of technologies around that. So depending on the environment, depends on what's involved and also the cost to the business to either retrofit that or install those sorts of things or even retrofit the ability to be able to open windows because in many environments that's not possible. So it's not, that, it's not something that would come for free and I think that is important to acknowledge. It is something that would come at a cost. But the cost of everyone getting infected with COVID and potential of long COVID is also considerable. And, and again, this idea of the right to safe air in the same way as we take for granted our right to things like safe water. Tegan Taylor, great to chat. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the show for this week. Thanks for your company. Bye for now.